I'll get the slideshow started from the current slide. All right. I think I got Lindsay when she came in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, I meant to give a shout out. Uh, congratulations on Josh in the. Uh, if any of you went to the uh, honors and awards today, that the uh, program was designed by Lindsay's brother Josh. It was really nicely done. And so, and all you who participated, way to go! That was a good, good event. Okay, Jay was here. All right. Any questions before we get started today? All right. We're not there, okay? Uh, we've already done that problem. Why is it starting back there? We've already done that problem. Ha! Ah, here's where we are. On page 156, conjugate pairs. Okay. Does anyone know what we mean by conjugate pairs? Believe it or not, you've dealt with them for years already. You may not have always called them this, but that's what they are. Anyone give me an example of a conjugate pair? Well, that's this great big juicy, no, that's the wrong kind of pair. Okay, a conjugate pair is a set of factors, usually binomials, okay? And here's the deal. If the first one is A plus B, guess what the second one is? A minus B, that's a conjugate pair. Now, just that, A plus B times A minus B, what's special about that? What does that result in? The difference of their squares, A squared minus B squared. Remember? And then that makes for a really easy factor. If you have a difference of two perfect squares, you know it factors to be a conjugate pair, A plus B times A minus B. All right, now then, I don't know if you remember this, but back when you did Irrational numbers, things with square roots in them. It's impossible to divide by a square root. I mean, it's miserable, not impossible, miserable to divide by a square root. So what we did, if you had a square root in the denominator, multiply by the conjugate pair, numerator and denominator, and then you have a real uh, denominator. Nice, really nice, okay? In complex numbers, which we just brushed over pretty quickly, how do you divide complex numbers? Multiply by the complex conjugate. If it's A plus BI, multiply by A minus BI. And guess what you get? No longer a complex number or imaginary part. Now you get a real number. So conjugate pairs come in very handy in many, many, many situations. And that's what they're going to talk about now but we're not going to pay that much attention to it because this deals with complex zeros. But I do want you to know this. Note that the pair of complex zeros, and this is from the previous example, are always conjugates of each other. They're of the form of A plus BI and A minus BI. Now, this is true. Remember what we're talking about here? This is true only if your polynomial function had real coefficients. If you had an imaginary number in a coefficient, then this rule doesn't hold. But if you had real numbers in the coefficients, which most of the time we do, then all your complex uh, solutions are going to come as conjugate pairs. So complex zeros always occur in conjugate pairs. If f is a polynomial function with real coefficients, they don't have to be integral co coefficients, real coefficients, then if A plus BI, uh, where B is not equal to zero, is a zero of the function, then the conjugate, A minus BI, is also a zero of the function. Okay? Now, be sure you see that this result is true only when the polynomial function has those real coefficients. If you have a complex coefficient, it doesn't work. Okay? For instance, this one f of x equal x squared plus 1. No solutions in the real number system. None whatsoever. However, in the complex system, i will be a solution. 
Because I squared is negative 1. Negative 1 plus 0 is 0. I mean, plus 1 is 0. Okay? But, yeah, you see these coefficients are real. 1 and 1. This one, however, the, and, and remember, plus and minus I. Will both be uh, solutions for that. How'd you get pairs? In this one, x equal i is the only one. Minus i does not work here. I would work. So if you have complex uh, coefficient uh, with imaginary parts, then this rule doesn't apply. But if it's real coefficients, it always applies. Okay. But again, we're not going to mess with many. I'm going to try not to include those on any test or anything. But you will see them on some of your homeworks. So, this leads to example six. Uh, and we will go through this even though it has an I as a solution. Find a fourth degree polynomial function with real coefficients, real coefficients, that has negative one, negative one, that's a, a, a repeated zero, and three I as zeros. But it's a fourth degree polynomial. How many complex zeros must it have? Fourth degree has to have four. Remember, integers are complex numbers. Real numbers are complex numbers. All numbers are complex numbers. Only if they have I in them do they have imaginary parts to them. So we've got three zeros. Do we know what the fourth one is? The answer is we should. Not zero. Notice it's polynomial function with real coefficients. A real coefficient, any complex zero with an imaginary part, but it's also a zero. It's conjugate. And what is the conjugate? Which one of these is, has an imaginary part? And what would be its conjugate? Negative 3i. Negative 3i. The real part stays the same, zero, okay? This is plus 3i, the other one would be zero minus 3i. That's the complex conjugate. So we know all four zeros. Now, how does that help us find the polynomial function? We know that what you want your variable to be. I don't want to choose it for you, but you probably will choose the same thing I would. What you want the variable to be? Say again. Variable. Variable. No, that's the number. Variable. X. Okay. Fantastic. So if, if these are your um, zeros, that means x equal negative 1 is a 0, x equal negative 1 is a 0, x equal 3i is a 0, and x equal negative 3i. Those are your four zeros. Fourth degree polynomial, four zeros. Yes. One of them's repeated. That's okay. One of them's conjugate of each other. That's okay. Okay, now, how could you find the fourth degree polynomial? And notice they say find a fourth degree polynomial. There's an infinite number of them. How do you find a fourth degree polynomial with real coefficients that has those as zeros? Remember back when we talked about if one of these things is true, all four of these things are true. Remember that? And it talked about if you have, know the zeros of a function, you automatically know three other things. One, you know the x-intercepts. Okay? Negative one's an x-intercept, and negative one's an x-intercept. That means it's a double intercept there. Now, this doesn't apply anymore. 3i and minus 3i are not on the x-axis. So they are not intercepts anymore. So that one sort of falls away. And these are also solutions to the um, equation f of x equals zero. That's what makes them zero, right? What was the third issue that if you know these are the zeros, you know something else about these polynomials? I know y'all know this, because you do it going the other way, you're probably not used to doing it coming back this way. What happens if you say on that first one, Add one to both sides. 
do it. That's legal to do, isn't it? That's an equation, right? You could add the same thing to both sides of an equation. What do you get then? X plus 1 equals 0. Now, what do you reckon the x plus 1 is? Okay, yeah, it, going back, it becomes x equals negative 1. But what would that be? That would be a factor of your function. Remember? If we're trying to solve the function, if you can factor it, get all the factors out there, set it equal to 0, and then set each factor equal to 0, and then do the reverse of this. Subtract 1 from both sides. So now we're going the other way. You're given the zeros, so find the factors and then multiply those factors together. That'll give you the polynomial function. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's do it. What are your factors? Here, what you want to name your function? F of x. That sounds like a great name for a function. Okay, f of x equal to, I gave you 1. What's that? x plus 1 times x plus 1 again, t x minus 3i times x plus 3i. Now this doesn't look very promising, does it? Because it looks like we're going to wind up with imaginary coefficients. And we said we need a function with real coefficients. Except that, do you remember what happens when you multiply times by times? Do it. What do you get? Let's multiply just those two together. X squared. I'm sorry? I can't hear. That would be plus 3i. Is that what you said? Plus 3i. Okay. I mean, my, plus 3i x. Minus 3i x. And then finally... What sign? Negative. Negative 3i squared. Well, what happens to the 3i x's? And what do they get? Zero. These go away. Hey, that's nice. x squared. Now, what in the world is i squared? Negative 1. And what's negative 3 times negative 1? Oh, wait, 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 wait. 3i times 3i is what? It's not 3i squared. I don't know who said that, maybe me or somebody else. It's not 3i squared. It's what? 3 times 3 is 9i squared. Ooh, must be a Thursday. Okay. So, i squared is negative 1, so negative 9 times negative 1 is plus 9. There's a factor. And guess what? Real coefficients. You lost your eyes. Oh, I'm black. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, so there you have a binomial, a quadratic binomial. And then we can multiply these two together pretty easily too. Anyone remember how to do that? Earth to class, earth to class, come in please. Okay. Oh, Melva's here. She came to the rescue. Okay, they've been waiting for you, Melva. Okay. What do you get when you multiply x plus 1 times x plus 1? Anyone remember? If you don't remember, we can always foil it. X squared. Plus 2x. Plus 2x, excellent. Plus 1. Got it. Now we have these two things multiplied together. Remember how to multiply a trinomial times a binomial? Yeah, you multiply each term by each term. So let's start there. It's a lot like falling, only you don't have a name to go with it. So x squared times x squared. x to the fourth. And then x squared, let me do it this way. x squared times plus 9 is 9x squared. Whoa, I erased the wrong one. Sorry. Okay. That's plus 9x squared. Now let's do an, okay, we'll keep going. 
Oh, we did. We finished that. Then let's go to the second one. Times, yeah, that's the 2x cubed. I didn't leave room for it. 2x cubed. Second. Plus 18x. Okay, and then finally we'll do plus x squared plus 9. Okay. Now, if you combine all those together, you get an x to the fourth plus 2x cubed plus 10x squared plus 18x plus 9. Wow. Okay. There we have it. Now, that's just one of the possible functions that have those as solutions. You want me to tell you the others? Multiply this by any constant. A. 17, 435, minus 15 eighths. You know, whatever you want to multiply the whole thing by, it doesn't matter if that will have these factors as solutions. These sort of zeros. Okay? Now, the reason I wanted you to do the problem is not for the I's sake, because we're not going to deal with those that much, but I wanted you to remember or be reminded, if you know the zeros, you know the factors. Remember that. You're going to need to do that in other cases. Um, so, that's the main reason I wanted to do this problem. Yeah, we could mention that complex conjugates and stuff like that, but the important thing is to remember how to go the other way. If you know the zeros, find the function. Okay, there is a checkpoint. Please do your checkpoints. Let me erase this and see if they do anything any differently. Okay, because 3i is a zero, it's a complex zero, the polynomial is stated to have only real coefficients, then you know that the conjugate, 0 minus 3i, must also be a zero. So there you have your four zeros, you know that's all the zeros you have, so you're set. What do you do next? Oh, you marked Brittany here. I saw you come in, but I forgot to stop talking. On. I'm, I mean, yeah. It's one of those B words, okay. Okay, B R I words, okay. Okay, sorry. Now, what do you do next? If you know those are the zeros, you know what the factors are. What are they? Say again. X plus one. X plus one. Here we have it. Then, using the linear factorization theorem. F of X can be written as F of X, that's what you, they chose to name it to, some constant A, any constant A, any A in the world, only as a number though, times X plus 1, times X plus 1, times X minus 3I, times X plus 3I. That's it. And you could just stop there and say, there's the polynomial. Usually they want you to multiply them out, so they're going to do, oh, oh, for simplicity, let's just say A equal 1. Any A would do. Don't choose A equals 0, okay? Don't ever choose that as 0. Any non-zero A, okay? So A equal 1 or 17 or 4 thirds pi or whatever. 1 is the easiest. Just let A equal 1. And then to multiply those two together, they started with their binomial, you know, uh, repeated root, and that gave them x squared plus 2x plus 1, exactly like y'all said. And then they multiplied the conjugates together, and without doing all of the foiling, they just went straight to the jugular and said if you have a plus bi times a minus bi, or vice versa, you have a squared plus b squared. So x squared plus 9. If you don't remember that, go on and foil it. Okay, and you'll get that answer if you do it right. Okay, so now we've got to multiply those two together, and they just give you the result, I think, without showing you how they got it. Sure enough, that's the same result we get. Any question? All right. Now, they skip example 7. And that says find a cubic polynomial f with real coefficients that has 2 and 1 plus 1 minus i as zeros and f of 1 is equal to 3. Now, normally I'd skip that one because it also has a complex root to it, 
but we haven't done that that we also plug in the value. So let's do that. I'll try to keep it from being too slow, but let's try to do it here. Okay. What we're told, cubic polynomial function Okay, with and they give you the name f with real coefficients. Okay, that has. Uh, they didn't say what variable they're going to use x, so we'll say x equal two and x equal one minus i. Those are our two zeros for that function. But we know if it's a cubic polynomial, what's its degree? Three. That's only two zeros. How do we get the third zero? Remember, it has real coefficients. Any ideas? Say again? Yes, 1 plus i has to be the other one. So we know automatically that x equal 1 plus i is going to be the other one. Get out of there. Okay. So what is that real polynomial function f going to be? f of x is going to be, okay. If those are your zeros, what are, what can you tell me next? It'll help you get the function. Say again? The factors, okay? What will be your factors? X minus 2. Okay. X minus 1 plus I. Remember, you move it across, so you're going to change the signs of both of those, right? And this will give you X minus 1 minus i. Okay, so those are our three factors right there. I didn't even need the commas in there. Okay? Okay, so I'll take them out. Those are the three factors. Now, what will be your function then? Some constant a, we don't know what the a is, times those three factors. x minus 2 times x minus 1 plus i times x minus 1 minus i. Now, these two are a little messier to do, to multiply. Um, what you might want to do is keep this as a entity, but that gets a little messy too. So let's just go on and do these as they are. I think the book will uh, it skips okay. Yeah. It does do something clever. Okay? So let me show you the clever thing it does. Okay? Notice these both start with x minus one. So you have x minus one plus i times x minus one minus i. Okay, well, that's a difference of two perfect, I mean, sum and difference of the same two numbers. So this will be a times x minus 2. My pen is really slow this morning. And then it'll be difference of two perfect squares. These are conjugates of each other, different conjugates, but they are. This will be x minus 1 squared minus i squared, right? Make that a bracket. You see that? By putting parentheses in here and there, now you have the difference, the sum times the difference of the same two numbers. So it would be this squared minus this squared. Okay? Now, take it one bite at a time. A times x minus 2. What is x minus 1 squared? Sounds sort of familiar, doesn't it? Not quite the same thing we did. What was it again? x squared. Nah. 
what do you have to have in between? X squared plus 1 is certainly in there, but you have to have, if you don't remember, go back and fill it. X minus 1 times X minus 1. That's what it means to square something. Multiply it by itself. Okay? And then when you fill it, you get X squared. Help me. Minus x. Minus x. Plus 1. There's your x squared and the plus 1. But what you have also is what? Minus 2x. It's the same thing Taylor did earlier with x plus 1. You square the first. Twice the product of the second, and this has a minus, and then square the last. Okay, that's what you get there. Minus i squared. What in the world is i squared? Not one. Minus one. And minus and minus makes it plus one. Sure enough, there's what you got. Well, let's clean that up a little bit. A times x minus two times x squared minus 2x plus 2. Okay? Now, let's do our multiplication of polynomials this way. x times x squared is x cubed. And then we have two terms with x squareds in them. There's one. That's a minus 2x squared. And here's another one, minus 2x squared, right? You have two terms with x's in them, plus 4x. Goodness gracious, this is so aggravating. Okay. And the other one with x in it would be plus 2x. Okay. Goodness gracious. Okay. All right. And then you have one term. I didn't draw the line here. Okay. Uh, this is pretty messy. One term with a constant, which will be a minus 4. Okay. Let's make sure we've accounted for all the terms. You have two factors here, three factors there. That should give you six factors. Six terms. One, two, three, four, five, six. Got it. So let's combine like terms. And what do you have? A times x cubed minus 4x squared plus 6x minus 4. And that is your function, f of x. This thing is driving me nuts. It keeps floating away like that okay now they also give you the fact that monitor monitor is here okay anyone else come in since the call roll okay now they also give you the fact that f of 1 is equal to 3 all right now so let's plug this in. I don't have much room. Let's do it here. F of 1 would be what? Okay. A times 1 cubed is? Goodness gracious, this thing is so messed up today. 1 cubed is 1 minus 4 times 1 squared is? No, 4 times 1, yeah, 1 squared is 1, minus 4 times 1 is minus 4, right? Okay. Plus 6 times 1 is 6, and minus 4. Whew. Okay. When you add the positives together, you get a plus 7. Add the negatives together, you get a negative 8. So that gives you a minus 1. So f of 1 is equal to a 
times a minus 1. But we know that f of 1 is 3. 3 is equal to minus a, right? So what would a be? Negative 3. So your f of x would be negative 3 times x cubed minus 4x squared plus 6x minus 4. There's your answer. Goodness gracious, this is a pain in the neck to, to write. Well, that's not the final answer because now you can distribute the minus x through there. So your f of x from up here, down here, is minus 3x cubed plus 12x squared minus 18x plus 12. And that sure enough is what they got there. Okay, now... Again, the reason we did this is not because of the complex conjugate, though that was true. But what I wanted you to do was take it from the zeros to the factors, multiply the factors together, but you know that f of x has a, you know, you can have many solutions for it with different a's in it. But if you knew one solution, f of 1 is equal to 3, you can plug that into the problem find out what the A is. Once you know what the A is, then plug that in back to your uh, solution here and multiply through. Just to show you how to take the problem full circle. The only reason I stopped to do that, not because of the eyes, as that did reinforce that, but because uh, that showed you how to come back and get the function. Hint, hint, you may see something like that again. Somewhere, I can't imagine where, but you could, okay? So, let's move on to factoring a polynomial. Oops, factoring a polynomial. Isn't that what we've been doing? Sure. So, what do we mean? The linear factorization theorem shows that you can write any nth degree polynomial as a factor, as a product of n linear factors f of x, now this is an nth degree polynomial, so you'll need n factors. Well, they use the subscript a sub n to let you know that's the degree of the polynomial. Okay? And remember, that's the thing we went back to find last time. And then each of those zeros, x minus c1 times x minus c2 times x minus c3 times x minus c all the way up to x minus c n. You've got to have n solutions. You have n linear factors. Remember, this could include multiplicities. C1 and C15 may be the same value. You just have a duplicate thing, but you still multiply them together. Also, these C's, and the reason they use C's now, they could be complex. They don't have to be real. In fact, for this to be true, you, they have to be complex because they're not always guaranteed to have that many real solutions. However, this result includes the possibility of some of the values C are complex, and some of them also may be repeated zeros and factors. Okay? Multiplicity of factors. Okay. So the following theorem, I've got a sneeze. Sorry about this. Are y'all awake yet? Okay. Just want to make sure. Uh, Time to go into a dumb story. The following theorem says that even if you do not want to get involved with complex factors, which we typically don't, you can still write f of x as a product of linear and or quadratic factors. Okay? Because if you have to. <laughs> a little cooler in here than I was anticipating when the warm shorts were shirt. Okay, uh, even if you have complex factors in the linear thing, you can always, that, since they're complex conjugates of each other, multiply them together and get a quadratic, right? So that's what we're going to do with those. So, <clears throat> every polynomial uh, of degree n greater than zero, one or more, with real coefficients, that's important, 
can be written as a product of linear and quadratic factors with only real coefficients, where the quadratic factors have no real zeros. In other words, they have complex zeros with imaginary parts. But we don't interested in those, we will leave them as quadratic factors, which I like doing better because who wants imaginary numbers anyway? It's like having imaginary friends. Never mind. Okay. I'm uh, sorry. All this sneezing is loosening. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> a quadratic factor with no real zeros is said to be prime or irreducible over the reals. We've had them all along. X squared plus one. You can get imaginary solutions, but you can't get any real solutions. Note that this is not the same as being irreducible over the rational. That would be if you had, when you did the quadratic formula, once you got it down to a quadratic factor, did the quadratic formula and you got minus 3 plus or minus the square root of 17. You can't do anything else. That would be irreducible over the rationals, but those are real numbers. CJ is here. <coughs> okay. Anyone else sneak in while I was watching? Okay. Now, and as I've just given the example, is for example, x squared plus 1, you can factor as x minus i plus, times x plus i. We're not going to mess with that very much, so don't do it. That's irreducible over the real numbers, and therefore over rationals as well, because you can't get that into reals, except in the quadratic form. On the other hand, this quadratic function, x squared minus 2, is... You can't get a rational zero from it, but you can get irrational zero. X minus root two times X plus root two. That is not irreducible over the reals. Those are real numbers, okay? But it is ir irreducible over rational numbers. We're going to handle those. It's irreducible over the rationals, but it is redu re reducible, goodness gracious, over the reals. All right, so when you come up with those, Use a quadratic formula, leave whatever you have there. Unless it has imaginary parts, then go back to the quadratic. So, I think we're ready for example 8. No. Oh, I see. The old slide set didn't have that example 7 we just did. Their example 7 is our example 8. So, that's what we're doing here. and That's exactly the same. Uh, and again, they've got it to this point of having a complex solution with imaginary parts. Okay? So find all the zeros of that given that x plus, uh, 1 plus 3i is a zero of f. Okay, what can you tell me about the coefficients of this function here? The coefficients. They're all real numbers. In fact, they're all integers. So we could use, and that's what we would have used if they hadn't given us this, we would have used the uh, rational zeros test. And that's what we would have done. Okay? But they gave us this uh, complex zeros, so let's use it. If that's a zero, and those are all real coefficients, what can you also tell me? So we know from here that x equal 1 plus 3i is a 0. Uh, no, yeah. Okay, what else can you tell me? x equal 1 minus 3i is also a 0, right? Now, what else can you tell me about that then? What's the conclusion you can get from there? <coughs> the first one? X, <clears throat> X, if you know it's a zero, what else do you know? Say again? Zero. We just did that, okay? But if you know it's a zero, whether it's real or imaginary or whatever, you also know it, what the 
What's the F word? The factor is. What's the factor? X, no, X minus 1 minus 3i is a factor. Remember that? We did it twice just before, right? And what's the other one tell you? X. No, not plus. Minus 1 plus 3i is also a factor. Okay? Now, if we know those two are factors, that means their product is a factor, right? So let's multiply those together. Now, and let's do the clever thing they did. Okay? X minus 1, we're going to put grouping symbol here. Okay? minus 3i times x minus 1 plus 3i that's also going to be a factor. The product of those two factors will also be a factor. Can we multiply those two together? What would that give us? Say that again. x squared minus Minus 2x Okay, let's back up Okay Let's back up Alright And notice that this is a sum times a difference of the same two numbers That's a conjugate multiplication Okay So what this is, is x minus 1 squared minus 3i squared, right? Sometimes the difference of the same two entities is the difference of their squares, right? Okay, now, what you were struggling with before, what is x minus 1 squared? x squared minus... Ah! 2x plus 1 plus, uh -uh, plus, plus 9, not i. When you square the i, you get a minus 1. And this would have been a minus 9 i squared. Minus 9 times minus, minus 1 is plus 9. Minus 9 times minus 1 is plus 9. That's what you get. Now combine the like terms, and what do you get? x squared minus 2x plus 10. Got it? Okay. So, we have that as a factor. Okay? And since we know that's a factor, we can do one of our favorites, right? Log division. And, fa and divide this factor, x squared minus 2x plus 10 into what we started with. x to the fourth minus 3x cubed plus 6x squared plus 2x minus 60. Okay? Didn't we like doing these? Sure we did. Okay? And let's start. How do you do long division? Where do you begin? x squared into x to the fourth, we've got how many times? x squared times. Then we do what? Multiply, and that gives us? x to the fourth minus 2x cubed. Is that what you said? I thought so. Okay. And? Plus 10x squared. And then what do we do with that? Subtract it, or if you prefer, change signs and add. I sort of like that. Change signs and add. So I've got to change. What's that? Wait just a second. Okay. All right. I'm slow. Okay. That goes away. Fantastic. What does that give us? Negative x cubed minus 4x squared. And then what do we do? 
plus 2. It bring down the 2x. Got it. Now what? Divide again. x squared into minus x cubed will go minus x times. And then we do what? Multiply. Minus x times x squared is minus x cubed. Minus x times minus 2x is <coughs> what? Plus 2x squared and minus 10x, right? I thought that's what you said. Okay. Now, what do we do now? Subtract or change signs and add. So I'm going to choose to do it that way because I make fewer mistakes doing that. All right. And what does that give you? Negative 6x squared plus 12x, and then you do what? Bring down a minus 60. And now what? Divide, and what does that give you? Negative 6. And then you multiply, and what does that give you? Minus 6x squared plus 12x. Wait, I can't write. My pen is messing up on me. I don't know why. Okay, minus 60. This one you don't have to do anything to, but look at it and see those are exactly the same. When you subtract, you'll get zero. Or change signs and add, you'll get zero. So we did find the other factor, x squared minus x minus 6. Okay, but guess what? We didn't really want the factors. We want the zeros. So how do you get the zeros from the factor? Well, are you through factoring that? How, what does that produce? X times X. Minus 3 and plus 2. Y'all are pretty good at that. You saw that right off the top and all these things keep popping up. Let's check it and see, make sure we did it right. X times X is X squared, that's right. Plus 2X minus 3X is minus X minus 6. Yes, yes, yes. So, they said find all the zeros. We already said that this was a zero and that's a zero. We found two of them. Here we have two more factors. Can you give me the zeros? X equal 3 or? Say that again. X equal what? Negative 2. Got it. Those are our other two zeros. That's what they're looking for, the zeros of that function. Since they told you one and you had uh, constant, uh, constant, uh, real coefficients, you know the other complex zero has to be a zero. The complex conjugate has to be a zero. Then do your division. See what the other quadratic factor is. See if you can factor that. You could. So now we have that one. What if you couldn't factor this? What would you do next? Quadratic formula. And when you use the quadratic formula, you're either going to get factors that you just didn't see how to factor, or you'll get irrational numbers, which are fine. They're still solutions. Or you'll get two more imaginary. And then that's fine. We found all the zeros. So if you can't factor, use the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula will either give you uh, rational zeros, irrational zeros, or complex zeros. So use them, whatever you get. All right. That was example eight. They say here it's seven. Let's clear the screen here unless there's some questions, are there? And then let's do see how they did it. Because the complex zeros occur in conjugate pairs, because you have real coefficients, you know that 1 minus 3i is also a 0. Okay, so what they do, that means both of those are factors. So x minus 1 plus 3i and x minus 1 minus 3i are both factors because you just uh, subtract them from the other side of the equation. And then multiplying those two together, x minus 1 plus 3i times x minus 1 plus, no, minus 1 minus 3i 
if you distribute the minus signs through and then rearrange your uh, parentheses, you get x minus 1 plus 3i and x minus 1 minus 3i. That's a, those are conjugates of each other. And they are x minus 1 squared minus, and they went on and multiplied them, 9i squared. Well, x minus 1 squared is x squared minus 2x plus 1, and minus 9i squared is minus 9 times minus 1 is plus 9, so 1 plus 9 is 10. So there you have your one quadratic factor. That's an irreducible quadratic factor. Irreducible quadratic in the real number system. You can't re reduce it. You can with the complex numbers, but not with the real numbers. So what do we do now? Yay! We do our long division. This is exactly like we did it. Except they like to move the the thing down here. I don't particularly care to because I'm doing this into that, and giving that, and then multiply here and give that. I like to move it that way, but. Whichever way you do it is fine with me. I don't care. Okay? And you'll see they did the same thing we did. X squared into X fourth is X squared. And they multiplied X squared times X squared is X fourth minus 2X cubed plus 10X squared. Then they just magically subtracted. I like to change signs and add. I wish they kept the thing lined up a little better, but it's pipe setting problem. Okay, so that would be uh, these two go out. This becomes a minus x cubed, minus 4x squared, bring down the 2x, divide again, and that gives you minus x, multiply minus x cubed, plus 2x, uh, minus 10, yeah, minus 10x, minus, plus 2x squared, minus 10x. When you subtract or change out and add, this one goes out again. This gives you minus 6x, minus 12x, bring down to minus 60, divide, and that time you get exactly minus 6 and it comes up with a remainder of 0. So you know that's also a factor. Since it's a factor, we'll try to factor it, okay? And it does, well, you write those two factors together, but you have it completely factored until you factor that one to be x minus 3 times x plus 2. They're looking for the zeros, so go back. And the ones you started with, 1 plus 3i and 1 minus 3i, they're still zeros at x equal 3 and x equal minus 2 over the last two. Make sense? So notice that we go from a zero to a factor, and we go from factors to zero. You've been doing this forever. It's just when you go the other way, you tend to say, whoa, how do you do that? It's the same thing, just in reverse. All right. So in that example 8, without being told that 1 plus 3i is a 0 of f, you could still find all the zeros by using synthetic division to find the real zeros. And that's basically how I would have done the problem. But I knew they were going to do it this way. I would have done the rational zeros test, and start testing. It may take a while on the front end, but then it makes it, I think, easier on the back end. Okay? Y'all need a review of that to remind yourself how to do rational zeros test? No? Okay. I'll take your word for it. All right. There is a checkpoint. I would definitely, definitely do the checkpoint. Okay. Now, here is another one. Before we get to other test. All right. Let's see. All right. Example nine in our text. Okay. Write f of x equal to x to the fifth plus x cubed plus two x squared. Minus 12x plus 8. Was that long enough? Okay. Write that as a product of linear factors and list all the zeros of the functions. Now, I'm going to, to modify that a little bit and say 
write this as a product of linear factors and quadratic, irreducible quadratic factors. So I don't care about getting all linear, especially if they have i's involved. So get it down to a quadratic and uh, see if you can go any further. So how are we going to approach this? What will be our procedure? Something I mentioned earlier, but we didn't do. You said you didn't want to because you knew we were going to do it here, didn't you? Second? The rational zeros test. And I have a feeling we're not going to have time to do it all. Okay, how time flies when you're having fun. Okay, so we're going to start next time with example 9, if I can find my pencil. There it is. Okay, I've written it out, but we're not going to do it. Okay, and let me erase this one because we don't want to get confused next time. All right, homework exercise is here. We almost got there, but not quite. Do any of the odds, 9 through 13, all those are at Calc Chat, 9's at Calc View. Do either 15 or 17, they're both at Calc Chat. Uh, do any of the odds, 19 to 27, they're all at Calc Chat, 25's at Calc View. Do either 29 or 31, they're both at Calc Chat, 29's at Calc View. Do either 33 or 35, they're both at Calc Chat. Either 37 or 39, they're both at Calc Chat. Uh, you can skip 41 to 45. Those all have eyes in them, so we're going to try not to do those. Okay, you can skip 47 and 49 because they both have eyes in them. Okay, try doing 51 or 53 or both. They're both at Calc Chat. Um, you can skip 55 through 59 because those have eyes in them. Um, and try doing all that you can of 61 through 71, okay? They're all at Calc Chat, 69's at Calc View. Do as many as you can of 73 through 77, they're all at Calc Chat, none at Calc View. And stop there, wait, yeah, stop there, we'll pick up the rest of those next time. Okay, now some of those you can't do, Wait till we do the rest of the examples, and if you still have questions about them, we'll do any that you have problems with, okay? All right, so we should finish easily, hopefully, 2.5 next time and get started in 2.6. And 2.6, we're not going to do the whole section, but we should get it done in a day or two. So I'm guessing the test will be probably not the next week, but Tuesday of the following. What's that? Is it already? Wow. Okay. We will rush and see if we can get it done. So you, okay, here's, we'll have two options, and maybe this will be the better option. Then what your final exam will be, will be two parts, two hour tests rather than one final test. Two. Your first one will be the chapter two test. I'll make it short. You can do it in an hour. And then the second part will be your uh, comprehensive. That will be both chapter one and chapter two. It'll be short. And that'll probably be much easier. I, they both will be pretty easy. Okay, so that's what we'll do then. Not have to take a class period next week to do a test and not get all the material covered. Sound okay? Okay. And so we'll have two tests for during finals week. You know, same day, two one-hour tests. And if you can't finish them both, you can uh, come back and finish them. Sorry about that. Running out of term. We lost at least two days. Good deal. Thank you. I'm sorry? Yes, you do. Okay. Everybody, remember that. I need your papers, too. Next week's the last week to turn in your papers. Huh? Is it like a paper from like last time?
Not the same paper. I know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Something to do with math. Absolutely. Yeah. 